Hello, BookTube. I have a tag for you here while I'm in the forested wilds of Vermont. <laughs> it's the Choose the Year book tag. It was created by uh, Mel at Mel's Bookland Adventure. And uh, it's it's year-based, so really it's infinite. You could do a million of these of versions of this tag yourself alone. Uh, because the, the question number one is to choose a year and say why. So you could pick any year and talk about its books. Now, of course, most people, when they do this tag, are choosing the year of their birth. And I want to do the same thing. So we will be talking about the year 1991. Uh, and in... <laughs> I didn't detect tittering, did I, book tip? <laughs> we will be talking about the year 1991, the year of my birth. Okay. Uh, and uh, the second question is, what books published in that year have you read? Uh, and I have read probably well over 1,500 books published in 1991. Uh, and I'm not, of course, going to list them all. The question wants to know which one have you read. Could you talk about them? But I do want to talk about some. I want to give you, want to run down a little uh, trip down memory lane of what books were like in 1991. I've drawn, I jotted down a whole list from a whole bunch of different sources here. It was, it was a bad year for some books. There, were, there was a lot of crap books that came out in 1991. I jotted down some of those. Uh, a Thousand Acres by Jane Smiley. Uh, Time's Arrow, The Kitchen God's Wife came out in 1991. Uh, Mating by the inf unfathomably boring Norman Rush. All of these came out in 1991. Uh, didn't I have another one? Oh, yeah, the mating, I got a note here that Rush won the National Book Critics Circle Award. They must all have been drunk. I, it's, it's, it could, try and read it and see if I'm wrong. It's, it's un impenetrably dull. Uh, but it wasn't it wasn't all bad. <laughs> I mean, there was there was another book, one of the most famous books, that instantly collectible, that came out in 1991, was Madonna's book, Sex, that was spiral-bound and covered in metal. And that was, you had, even in 1991, you had speculators swooping in to buy a whole boxes. At the bookstore where I worked at the time, I had people come in and say, I, I want you to go to your shipping and receiving room and just wheel me out a box. I don't want you to open it. I don't want anybody to touch these things. I will just buy the whole carton of these books. But also, also, somewhat confusingly, <laughs> in the bookstore where I worked in 1991, we had people trying to shoplift this book. <laughs> it's, it was, it's a huge coffee table book with metal covers. <laughs> it's, it's, it is impossible to shoplift, and, and yet we had people trying. And I would, I would just stare at them. You know? <laughs> what on earth did you think was going to happen here? <laughs> uh, but I also wanted to I would go through a, a list of books that came out in 1991 and just talk about them. I made a list here because it was great to go down memory lane. Like, for instance, Diane Middlebrook's biography of Anne Sexton came out, and it was it's really, really good. Sexton is a very tricky person to write a biography of, because if you read her poetry, you're instantly going to love her as a poet. Her poetry speaks right to you. She's one of those poets that you will instantly love. But she herself was not lovable. And a lot of the reasons she wasn't lovable were biochemical. And that's awkward. That's just really awkward for a biographer. I've often thought that in cases like that, a biographer shouldn't write the biography of the person. Just don't do it. Uh, but uh, but Middlebrook does a really graceful job, probably the best kind of job that could be done. Uh, and what else we got here? Oh, yes, uh, Clark Clifford uh, wrote a book, Counsel to the President. He didn't write the book. He, he really stem winded and told stories to, uh, to uh, another figure that we've seen on this channel, Richard Holbrook. Just recently on this channel, I, I held up and praised a book called Our Man, which is a, sort of a biography of Richard Holbrook, who was a, a diplomatic arm twister for the United States Diplomatic Corps forever and ever. Uh, and he is the one who really put pen to paper for counsel to the president. But, uh, but uh, Clark Clifford had an unbelievable career with a whole bunch of presidents who considered him indispensable. It, and, and a whole bunch of different presidents, too. Not, not just uh, John F. Kennedy, but also Lyndon Johnson, Jimmy Carter, and a whole, uh, uh, Harry Truman. He, uh, he was... He was on a, a phone Rolodex for a whole bunch of people who wanted uh, sage advice. And the book is wonderful. The book really, really captures his gentle, authoritative voice on the page, which is a remarkable feat anyway for a writer to do. It's even more remarkable when that is being done by a raving, spittle-flecking egomaniac. 
<laughs> like Richard Holbrook, you you would be amazed that he could sublimate himself for even five minutes. <laughs> but he does he, all throughout the book. It's amazing. It doesn't sound like Richard Holbrook at all. Uh, but uh, we can't we can't go on at this length for every book. <laughs> but but we'll, we'll do a, we'll do a few more here. Uh, Deadline by James Rustin uh, came out. James Rustin is it's a fantastic newspaper book the news news hounds especially the old generation with the mechanical press and the ink and the the multiple editions per day people from that era who remember that era love to write about it they love to wax on about it they always make it seem tougher than it was they always make it seem more heroic than it was <laughs> and that's understandable because it's a vanished world and those things come with a vanished world but deadline is is gripping especially if you are interested in journalism or may god have mercy on your soul you want to pursue a career in journalism. If, if that's true, this is one of the books that you're going to read. Uh, who else have we got here? Oh, yes, uh, Nicholas Boyle, the, 1991, saw the first big volume in his multi-volume biography of Goethe. Amazing stuff. Amazing. A bit on the dry side, but only because... I mean, he's trying his hardest in the volume. It's a bit on the dry side because there's so much to cover. Just so much. Goethe is a, a, a figure who routinely defeats his biographers. It's fun to watch, and it, it, it routinely happens. I'm actually kind of amazed uh, that the Nicholas Boyle volumes are not here in this little farmhouse. This is, it's exactly the kind of thing I would expect to see here, but in my rather extensive prowling of these bookshelves, I don't think I've seen it. I guess it'll have to be another thing that we keep our eyes out for. Uh, oh, uh, R.W.B. Lewis wrote The Jameses, a big, fat volume about the James family. Not just Henry James, the famous... Uh, author but also his brother his sister his father just uh, the, the, it turned, uh, a wonderful collective portrait of the family tough to do collective portraits like that are tough to do it's tough especially with a, fa a family like the jameses the lowells would be another example but in a family like the jameses it's really tough to stop the star from stealing the show it's tough to make it for it not to be just a book about henry james uh, and lewis succeeds it's a, it's a james book to have even if you can't like I was for a long time, if you just can't stomach the idea of writing a huge bi reading a huge biography of just Henry James, who on earth would want to spend that much time with Henry James? If Edith Wharton couldn't do it, you can't do it. If you if you look at that and you think, oh, I don't really want to do that, this is a perfect way to get around that because this is, James does not steal the show. So this is, it's a, a a wonderful volume. Uh, we also saw the year also saw Philip Zegos' biography of King Edward the Eighth. Um, a big stately book by one of the greatest biographers of the 20th century about the the man who <laughs> abdicated. <laughs> he abdicated the throne of England in order to marry the woman I love. The twice-divorced American adventurous Wallace Warfield Simpson. <laughs> and the, the, the accomplishment of Ziegler's book is that it isn't all about that. It, it necessarily any biography of Edward VIII is going to be mostly about that. That is the only thing that Edward VIII did that is noteworthy in history. He barely did anything as king, but he did a lot as prince. He did he did a lot as as heir to the throne, and maybe there's a kind of grubby glamour that you can glom from his his years wandering around as the Duke of Windsor. If Ziegler does about as good a job as anybody could do of that. He's too easy on Edward on a lot of different points, including treason. Uh, but overall, he gets a more consistently in interesting story out of that life than any other biographer that I've read, and I've read them all. <laughs> so so, so I, that was another, another great one to see there. Also, uh, as far as big, really good biographies, Robert Conquest's book on Stalin came out in 1991. And a lot of new archival stuff has come to the fore since then. I, th I think it's safe to say uh, that, that Stalin has, that this book has been superseded by later work on Stalin, including Stephen Kotkin's gigantic, ongoing mess, a uh, mass thing. It's going to be tough to top that, that series when it's done. Uh, but in terms of a, a really readable and very responsible, historically responsible, one volume, Life of Stalin, Conquest is really good. And it's also really smart. It's not just that he's being dutiful as a biographer. You're going through, you're reading through that book and you're thinking, boy, oh boy, this guy's doing a really clear job with his subject, but he's a lot smarter than I am. He's trying to hide it, but I can tell. That's a nice feeling. In an odd way, that's a nice feeling. Uh, 
Move on to who else we got here. Should we move on to uh, fiction? Oh, yes, we can move on to fiction. A 1991 saw the, the publication of Maximum Bob by Elmore Leonard. A hoot of a novel. Leonard has, you know, the two registers. His novels are either super serious or they're kind of absurd. They're kind of funny, absurd. And amazingly, uh, for a crusty old guy, he did both equally well, I think. I think he's... Uh, Maximum Bob, I think you could generously call it a, a comic novel. I mean, one of the main characters is a, is a gigantic reptile. <laughs> so, so I think you, you could you could reasonably call that a comic novel. Certainly, Carl Hyacinth's book *Tourist Season* also features a giant reptile, and we call that a comic novel. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I, I I'm sure that *Maximum Bob* has been done in the Library of America, so it's probably here in this in this farmhouse. This farmhouse has a rather generous collection of Library of America volumes. I haven't seen it on its own though. Kind of weird, in a way. I, I know. I know that if you want, if you want Richardson Reed, you'll go to that channel for it. In fact, I'll leave a link down below. I think I promised that yesterday and forgot to do it. Uh, but I know if you, you'll want, if you want Richardson Reed, you'll go to that channel. But nevertheless, I'm here, so yeah, you're going to hear a little bit about it. And it seems to me that that Elmore Leonard would be a natural to be in this library, and I don't remember seeing much of it. I mean, his big, the big volume of his western stories. Yes, absolutely. That's got to be here somewhere. <laughs> There's a major problem with the universe. But I would also expect books like Maximum Bob and, and, and other things. I'll have to look around and see. Maybe I just missed them. Maybe they're in a nook or cranny. The thing about 150-year-old little farmhouses is that they're full of nooks and crannies. So, so there could be some that I haven't found. But in terms of fiction, also in that same year was published uh, John Mortimer's book, Rumpole a la carte, the latest, at the time, collection of Rumpole the Bailey short stories. And the title short story Rumpel a la carte refers to the to Rumpel defending the tempestuous and arrogant uh, celebrity chef Jean Pierre O'Higgins, <laughs> who is runs a a high Tony restaurant in London. And one night when they're they're serving up their extremely hoity toit meals, the the uh, server on uncovers a, a dish for one of the patrons in the restaurant and there's a mouse a live mouse on the plate and, uh, and a whole bunch of legal shenanigans come up from there and it's a wonderful wonderful story but there are also uh every story in that volume is just wonderful and the cover was also wonderful the cover the dust jacket illustration for the american edition no idea how much rumpole is here at the farmhouse. I'm pretty sure there's a folio society of Rumpole, but I don't know that I've seen any others. Maybe he's, maybe maybe the house is not a fan. Uh, what else do we have here? Do we have more fiction? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, Brotherly Love by Pete Dexter, who's kind of fallen off the radar of, uh, of American letters. It's, it's a terrible shame. Uh, I don't think he's had a book in a long time. I'm, I'm Now I'm wondering if maybe he's dead. Every once in a while, I will I, on this channel, I will muse, boy, this author sure is lazy. They haven't had a book in a while. And then one of you will crumble, chime in in the comments field saying, he died 10 years ago, you moron. <laughs> so maybe that's the case. I hope not, because he was a nice guy. Uh, but Brotherly Love is a, just a harrowing novel, just harrowingly violent. Oh, my God. And, and yet, as, with, as is true with every Pete Dexter novel, it has as, at its heart a truly good man. This, this is an author who, one of the last authors, I believe, in the 20th century, who could write a truly good man without condescension and without sentimentality. Uh, we, we, we don't see that so much in his masterpiece, Paris Trout. But I think Paris Trout is pretty much a masterpiece because there are no good people in it. I, and I overwhelmingly recommend Paris Trout by Pete Dexter if you can. If you haven't read it, find a copy and read it. But Brotherly Love will stick with you also. It's, it's amazingly good. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, and another uh, novel that came out in 1991 is a masterpiece of American writing. A great American novel. Uh, nothing that uh, Pete Dexter wrote Paris Trout. It is a great American novel in a minor key. But the next book I want to talk about is a major American novel in a major key. It's a masterwork. It's The Goldbug Variations by Richard Powers, who just won the Pulitzer Prize for the overstory. The Goldbug Variations is amazingly packed. It is just a gigantic Mahler symphony of a novel and, and ruthlessly, amazingly intelligent and incredibly moving. There are three scenes in that novel, one near the beginning and two near the end, that would make a stone statue cry. They're um, just amazingly good. So so much so that uh, you will, they cast a shadow over the next few books. He's been praised a lot for Galatea 2.2, for instance. And 
when I read Galatea 2.2, I thought, okay, well, this is a competent novel, but all I could think about was this is nothing like the Goldbug Variations. The Goldbug Variations is War and Peace, and this is just a novel. It might have that effect on you, too. I would hunt it down <laughs> if I were you from 1991. Uh, and then uh, I said just a few more, didn't I? Well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. We'll move on here. Uh, we'll do, we, can do, we can do some uh, history, like Michael Beschloss, who's, I believe, still alive. Now, I don't want to jinx myself, but he wrote a big book called The Crisis Years about John F. Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev that's amazingly good. Just uh, not derivative at all. Just it digs over all the ground and covers not just the Cuban Missile Crisis, but the whole atmosphere of tension and brinkmanship between these two, the two most powerful men in the world. Uh, really, really good. I, uh, I have a pretty high standard for Kennedy books, and this one meets it. Uh, and I don't own a copy, and I don't think there's a copy in this house. So, so we really, I really need to find a copy of that book. Uh, but also another book, another work of history that I've mentioned on this channel, I've read from it, uh, and it's fantastic. It's uh, Robert Massey's Dreadnought big thousand page book about the build up to World War One, and that description makes it sound boring but I read an excerpt from it and I could read many more if I had a copy I don't think there's a copy here in this house but it's uh, not boring <laughs> not at all even the long lovingly detailed chapters that he gives us about obscure figures in the high finance world of pre-war Germany you'd think those would be a snooze fest and they're not at all not at all they're invigorating uh, so as a work of history uh, we can do we can do that. Uh, do we have any more fiction? I can see your eyes glazing. Oh yes, of course. Uh, the Dark Beyond the Stars by Frank Robinson, uh, science fiction, and it, there's a there's a, a familiar storyline, a familiar gimmick in science fiction, and that is the generation ship. The, a science fiction novel that uh, that operates under the preface the premise that there's nothing faster than the speed of light which is postulated by Einsteinian physics. So I know it's just a given in science fiction that, of course, nobody travels at just the speed of light. But in generationship novels, the idea is that since nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, you need to make a ship into a living colony because the people who launch from Earth to go to a distant planet are not going to be the ones that arrive there. It's going to be their distant descendants who arrive there. And The Dark Beyond the Stars is a great generationship novel. Just great. Uh, the best that I've ever seen for that particular type of novel. And I've read quite a few of them. Uh, but I had other fiction on here as well. Uh, Outlander by Diana, Diana Gavilon came out in 1991. Swept us all away. I remember reading that. I remember getting it and thinking, oh, okay, well, this is, you know, this is just a Catherine Cohen. This is a gigantic, overstuffed, overheated, melodramatic, big, fat, historical romance. But there's... And those of you who've read it, I'm, course, I'm assuming that all of you who've read it love it. And you'll know right away that that isn't accurate. It's, it is big and overstuffed, but it is wonderful. It's, it's not, it doesn't feel uh, gassy at all. <laughs> uh, and also, uh, while we're talking about... I mean, Outlander did really well, but Outlander has, is one of those novels that has sold better the longer it's been out. It wasn't a runaway bestseller at first. It did really well, but it wasn't a runaway bestseller. Whereas 1991 did see a book that was a runaway bestseller as soon as it came out, and that was The Firm by John Grisham, which is a fairly effective legal thriller. Grisham's a terrible writer, terrible with character, terrible especially with pacing and plotting. God, don't don't have Britta read a novel of his. The very things that she prizes the highest, he does the worst. And oddly enough, as I've said on this channel many times, those are exactly the kind of things that are weaknesses in a novel that a screenwriter and a director will purge away completely. That's why I always say that the movie adaptation of a book is almost always better than the book. That is certainly true of The Firm. The movie The Firm with Tom Cruise is incredibly good. Far, far more involving than the novel. <laughs> uh, but there is... There is one other novel that I want to mention that came out in 1991. <laughs> Perhaps you've heard of it. It's by Brett Easton Ellis, and it's called American Psycho. <laughs> and it's a downright strange novel. It, those of you who were alive at the time will remember that the, the publishing house that was going to bring it out had a whole bunch of staffers quit because it's so grotesquely misogynistic. It, it's such a grotesquely sadomasochistic novel. It's like the author is trying to revolt his readers. I believe that is what he was trying to do. Revolt them and also terribly enrage them. And what, what a lot of people missed at the time 
when the book came out, they were concentrating on the fact that they were revolted and that they were enraged. And what a lot of people missed at the time is that that is a writerly accomplishment. <laughs> to be able to do that is a writerly accomplishment. Most writers that try to do that fail completely. American Psycho does not fail to do that. I don't think it's literature in, in any serious sense of the word. I don't think it, that it deserves the unbelievable dude bro following that it has today. But then again, I don't think any dude bro book does. So, uh, but, but in terms of effectiveness as a book, which maybe is literature, maybe that is what we're talking about, I don't think you can deny it even now. Uh, so I couldn't let 1991 go by without mentioning it. Uh, also, just as a side note, the first part of Angels in America came out in 1991 when the AIDS epidemic was raging uh, and when not a lot of people expected it to end and not a lot of gay people expected to survive it. So uh, the, the whole of the thing, the whole work of Angels in America is amazing, a, a landmark work of American drama but I, I, the first part was 1991 uh but anyway that that's that's enough for a, for a books roundup for 1991 the question number three if you forgot we're doing a tag it has other questions question number three is uh are there any books published in the year that uh that sound interesting uh that you would read now and i as i think that i have read all the major releases from 1991 in all the major genres certainly in this much time i think I, that i have and a lot of them sound interesting which is why i read them but i don't in terms of like for instance i was looking over the lists that are published online there are a whole bunch of sources for lists of stuff that came out in a given year that's why this tag is so inviting uh and i was looking over all of those lists and i wasn't hitting anything that i haven't read the the uh all of the great nonfiction works, the, the large collections of poetry, Paul Muldoon and a whole bunch of other people. A, a lot, most of the stuff that I saw, I have read. So I, there's nothing that really intrigues that is still not done, no. Uh, then number four is most obscure sounding book. Uh, and I think that would probably be a work of literary criticism. I mean, it doesn't get much more obscure than that. Frank Kermode, who's fantastic. He's, he's a, an amazingly good read, read on literary subjects. But we can pick on him. <laughs> he, he had a, a new collection in 1991. That's, that's probably good enough. I bet probably 10 people read it in that year. Probably more people have read it since then. But that'll go. <laughs> that'll, that'll do for most obscure. Uh, and then the last question is uh, the strangest book cover. And I've been, I've been watching variations on this tag. I've seen people call up all sorts of exotic, weird, you know, psychedelic, trippy covers. But as far as I'm concerned, the, the strangest cover from 1991 was a book I've already mentioned. American Psycho features a close-up photograph of an actual person. It's not a, fa it's not a painting or, or an idealization. It's a photograph of a young man. And I've always wondered, I wondered as soon as the book came out, who is this guy? <laughs> what must that have been like? in the mid-90s, for him to be walking down the street or walking into a party or walking to a bar mitzvah and the people who've read this book indelibly associate its, its warped and twisted contents with this guy's face, with his dead-eyed stare. It, that face belongs to somebody. <laughs> I think that's just so strange. But I wonder who that guy is. Probably the internet could tell me who that guy is. But I think that was a really strange choice for a book. I mean, I understand it on one level because Patrick Bateman, the main character is the only character in the book who actually has any semblance of three-dimensionality. And I understand that, that it's an uncomfortable three-dimensionality because he's a psychopath. And I understand the decision of putting a face right there, big and center on the cover, because that's also unsettling as a cover design. So I approve of it. It's just weird that it's an individual person. I want, There's somebody out there with that face walking around with the face of, of American Psycho. The letters are as big as life on his face. American Psycho. <laughs> But anyway, that's it for the uh, for the Choose Your Year book tag. I don't actually know how old this tag is, uh, so I'm hesitant to tag people. So I'm going to resort to the usual punt on BookTube and say, do this tag. Whether you've done it before or not, if you've done it for your birth year, as I am doing for the year 1991, if you've done it for your birth year, then pick another year and just do that. It's too much fun to do it only once. I might do it again myself, so... If I do, you'll be, the, you'll be the first to know. But in the meantime, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, so I will, I will see you soon. Thank you, book two.